The name embodies our profession. The preeminent tool of our trade bears the name, and the brilliance of the individual who carries the name engineered our field's revolution. Creative genius, for many, a hidden attribute existing only within one's intellect, but for the rare few, the art of ingenuity comes innate. And such is the case for this one-time young, unassuming soapbox derby champion and model plane enthusiast from Cincinnati, Ohio. Well, I think the precursor uh, as a child, my, my father died when I was about seven. So a lot of the uh, standard household fix-up things and chores were really kind of left to me and I, I enjoyed it, it was fun. Uh, and then as for recreational uh, pursuits, I, I built model airplanes and uh, worked with wood, uh, building like soapbox car derby racers. I uh, got so good at building model airplanes, I used to build them and then sell them to the neighborhood kids, uh, usually at a significant multiple, because they either didn't want to build them or they didn't know how to or didn't have the patience. So that, that was kind of my first self-employment, I guess. One of the first things that 12-year-old Thomas Fogarty worked to make better was the gear shifting system on his Cushman motor scooter. There was a friend uh, in grade school. Uh, interestingly enough, his name was Pinhead, a kid's name. <laughs> Pinhead, and, and he was uh, what would you would call now an egghead. He had a motor scooter. When you had to shift in the low, what would happen, the guy in the rear end would end up with his rear on the street, and the Cushman would be about 10 yards ahead. You know, we got to thinking, uh, you know, how can we make this a smooth transition? So that, the, essentially, it, most inventions, as they often do, uh, come out of necessity and recognizing a need. And so that was the origin of it. Tom and Pinhead revamped the clutch apparatus, allowing for smoother gear transitions, a design that became commonly applied in industry and is still commonly used today. And most importantly, this initial venture as an inventor also became a valuable lesson in capitalism. Well, it was my first experience in learning about patents. Uh, Pinhead and I worked part-time in a small motor repair shop. And we did a lot of the work in that shop with their parts, and of course that they own it. That's the way the law reads. As a teenager, Tom helped support his family by taking a job in the central supply of a local hospital. At that time, they did all the autoclaving, they sharpened all the hypodermic needles, they cleaned all the hypodermic needles, they kept the IV solutions. We kept the oxygen tanks and we kept the stomach pumps that they used at that time. And so I worked my way out of the central supply to a position of a scrub technician. So you handed instruments to the doctor, uh, as a nurse would do, uh, but they, call, they called us scrub technicians. and. Uh, I, I had a chance at a very early age in high school to observe a lot of surgeries. And it was clear to me that some of them didn't work. And one that didn't work was uh, embolectomy and thrombectomy, where they, a patient would have an occlusion of an artery. And it usually ended up being three operations. The first one, and then the second day they came back to redo it to take more clot out that they missed. And the third one was usually an amputation. So it, it, uh, it was pretty easy to say this isn't working because half of them end up with amputations and uh, uh, another uh, half would die. This early experience led to Fogarty's first historic invention. In just his first year of medical school at the University of Cincinnati, he initiated bench tests on a balloon expandable device that would revolutionize vascular surgery. It came on kind of like a light bulb. Okay, I gotta, I gotta get this out. How can I get something down there, expand it, and pull the cot out? Now, the interesting thing about that whole thing is the conventional wisdom at that time was if you manipulated the inside of an artery, it would lead to immediate thrombosis. Essentially, I did it 
in, in my room at home. Uh, I made a lot of model airplanes. I used to fly ties. So what I would do is take a, a old ureteral catheter, uh, or one that was used, sometimes I'd steal a few, uh, and then I'd cut the baby finger off a of number five glove. And I tied it onto the end of the catheter with uh, fly tying techniques. And then I would take a hypodermic needle, cut it off so it's blunt, and then force fit it into the, the catheter so I could inflate the balloon through that hypodermic needle and inflate the balloon. And uh, I initially tested it in clots and long test tubes. And, uh, and then it went to immediate clinical use. I mean, there was no FDA at that time. As word slowly spread throughout the staunch surgical community that there was, in fact, a new, less invasive alternative to the dreaded amputation procedure, Fogarty relocated to perhaps the ideal institution to further advance his creativity, the University of Oregon, and a collaboration with a physician known today simply as Crazy Charlie. When I got there, Charlie Dodder was aware uh, that I developed a balloon catheter. So I, I, I made him a catheter, and it, and it actually was worked. I think its first use was in uh, about 1965. It was really the first balloon dilatation of an artery, and it was an iliac, and it was documented patent about seven years later by an angiogram. The alliance with the radiologist's daughter was discouraged by Tom's surgical chief, but like all determined innovators, Fogarty was unwavering. So uh, that did not end the relationship with Charlie, but certainly openly it did, because he wanted me to continue to make the balloon catheters, so I'd make them and then drop them off at the admitting office, and one of the residents would sneak over and take them back and and use them. And then occasionally I would do cut downs for him, usually in the middle of the night. Uh, and then he could pass the catheter, uh, you know, because they, they, they would not, at that time, sheaths were not well developed. And so uh, what, what we would do is a direct stick into the artery and then actually pass the balloon through that hole in the artery, get it in position, then we do an arteriotomy so we get the cot out. But it was still a very small incision. Uh, so that was a very interesting experience. At that time I didn't recognize uh, how unusual Charlie was <laughs> because I, I just assumed that oh, this guy's trying to make things better, which he was. More innovations would follow as Fogarty moved on to accept a post at the Stanford University Medical Center in 1970, where Dr. Norman Shumway and his colleagues were in the midst of their revolutionary transplant research. My observation is that certain institutions will go into a time period where there's a lot of innovation, uh, not only in one department, but multiple. And uh, that was true at that time of what was going on here at Stanford. Uh, that what, what Shumway was doing is promoting uh, essentially the use of tissue valves, one of the first proponents, and those were autographs. And they were taken from fresh cadavers and preserved in antibiotic solution and refrigerated, but uh, and used within usually three to four days of harvesting. So we spent a lot of our time harvesting valves. Uh, and developed a, a tissue valve bank, uh, which uh, was really ahead of the curve at that time. Uh, and then, of course, transplantation. So, and that was true at Stanford or at Oregon. I said, there's just sort of a group of innovative people who happened to all be all in the same institution pretty much at the same time. Tom took this experience and developed the xenograft tissue valve and in 1980, Fogarty the inventor became Fogarty the entrepreneur, forming Fogarty Research and Development. He and his team of engineers are responsible for many of today's most commonly utilized medical devices, including the Fogarty surgical clips and clamps, the breast biopsy system, and an emergency automated resuscitator. We prototype it, then we bench test it, and sometimes we'll do animal 
or cadaver testing if it's possible. And we'll make iterative changes as we go along. And uh, that's the process that I've used and we use it consistently. So you really have to make the engineer part of the process and intimately part of the process. Uh, even to the extent they, they learn to do the animals, the procedures, uh, they are involved in the cadaver testing, if there's cadaver testing. Uh, and that's the only way they have an appreciation for the problems. Uh, of course, seeing the actual surgery is, is a critical part of that, and seeing it not just once, but multiple times. Perhaps the endovascular field has benefited most recently from Fogarty engineering inventions, all due to Tom's vision of the cardiovascular medicine evolution. It was clear to me that endovascular surgery was going to be a dominant approach. And how long it was going to take, I didn't know. But my, my faith in that uh, was probably um, emphasized by the fact that we hired interventional radiologists as part of our surgical group back in the early uh, 70s. So they, they, they were just part of the group. And, and I, by that exposure, I, I stayed current and, and you know, did procedures independent of them, but also did procedures with them. So, the, and the interesting thing at that time, my, my focus was less invasive or minimally invasive or endovascular. You could get no endovascular articles published in the standard uh, journals, because all surgeons said, you know, it doesn't work, it'll never work and you should never do it. And that was the traditional wisdom, once again, that uh, I think delayed uh, acceptance. Uh, it's very difficult to train for a six to seven year period and come out of that training and be confronted with another technology that's gonna replace you. Your natural tendency is to say that doesn't work. Fogarty Engineering now holds more than 70 patents including endovascular devices like the mole ring cutter, the Aspire stent, and the Anurex aortic stent graft. And the company has contributed to the creation of over 30 companies. In recent years, you'll occasionally find Tom away from the interventional suite, up north of Palo Alto on a glorious 325-acre hillside at his award-winning Thomas Fogarty Winery, which produces some 15,000 cases of premium vino annually. And if you think it's a hobby, well... The winery is a real business. I mean, this is not a hobby, uh, and it's a serious business. It's a tough business. Uh, it's not very really romantic, like a lot of people think. It's, it's, if you treat it like a romance, you'll, you'll get in trouble. If you try to characterize people who are successful, they have one common trait that's absolutely persistent. 99% of the time, that is, they work very hard long hours. So the harder they work, the luckier you get as the way it ends up coming down. Spoken like a true tireless entrepreneur. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand in tribute to the consummate innovator, global force in medical device innovation, dynamic physician entrepreneur, architect of endovascular therapy, master educator, problem solver extraordinaire, and recipient of the 2004 New Cardiovascular Horizons Achievement, Dr. Thomas J. Fogarty.